going to introduce our, our second speaker. Um, second speaker is Malcolm McKay. Malcolm is an urban designer and infill expert. His presentation will outline the issues that our city faces, the elements of urban sustainability and best practice urban design, and some of the things we need to do to make our city a better place. So Malcolm's question is on the pink sheet, and it reads as follows. Everyone generally agrees that a sustainable city is a good idea, and there are lots of things that others can do, but what are you prepared to do? And I'd like you to think about that while Malcolm gives his presentation. Welcome, Malcolm. Thank you for coming tonight. Can we give him a welcome? Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming along tonight. And also thank you to James for, uh, for his talk. He's taken a lot of the hard work out of mine. Uh, you may not actually believe this, but I hadn't seen James's presentation and he hadn't seen mine. But basically, he's set all the framework up for it and I just have to show you the pictures. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it should be a, a, a fairly simple task. Right. Buttons. Introduction. Away we go. Uh, Captain, I can't hold it for much longer. Um, we have a bit of a crisis. Um, to put a bit of drama on it, we have freeways that are, that are uh, getting increasingly, uh, increasingly clogged. Uh, we're losing bushland. We have sort of suburbia that is sprawling out uh, beyond, uh, way beyond uh, what people ever imagined. And our meagre public transport network is, is creaking at the seams. Uh, it suggests that perhaps not all is well, well in, the, uh, in the world of Perth. And uh, look, it's a reality that uh, car-based cities have a size I wish they get to when they become dysfunctional. All around the world, most of the other cities have already got there. Uh, we're playing catch up, uh, but we are at that point now. We're at a tipping point where we need to do something different. And we really need to start thinking about how we create a more sustainable city. But before we, need to, before we do that, we need to think about why we actually need urban areas in the first place. I mean, why? You know, why aren't we all living on five acre lots all the way between here, here and Cairns? And the, the best explanation I've ever come across was from a guy from Queensland, a commentator called David Engwicht, who said towns and cities were invented to facilitate human exchange the exchange of information, friendship, material goods, culture, knowledge, insight, skills, and also the exchange of emotional, psychological, and spiritual support. In other words, it's all about people. People need other people, and we need to be close to other people. It is that interaction between us that we have urban areas. Which I thought was really clever. But then what he went on to say was that a sustainable city is one that maximizes human interaction whilst minimizing the travel necessary to do it. And if there is one thing, just one thing, that I'd ask you to take away from all of the stuff that I talk about uh, this evening, it's that. Just remember, sustainability is predominantly about maximizing human interaction and minimizing the amount of travel to do it. If you get that, you've really got 80% of what urban sustainability is all about. But just in case you didn't, I'll run through it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first fundamental is living and working together. It's creating an environment where people live, work, rest, play. They do the whole gamut in, 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 in the, the same place. In the perfect city, no one would ever have to travel at all. And in fact, there is, on the planet, there is something that is quite close to the perfect city. Uh, it's called Manhattan. And... Uh, it just put it in perspective, in Manhattan, uh, around about uh, so a little bit less than 20% of all of the trips that people make are made in a car. Um, more than 80% are made in public transport and walking. Perth is the complete opposite. Uh, here, around about 80% of all the trips we make are in car and 20% are in, in, on, on foot or in, in public transport. Uh, but the beauty of, that, of, of, of Manhattan that that doesn't actually capture is that a lot of the time, you don't have to get on any sort of vehicle at all. Uh, if you live in Manhattan, you can pretty well have everything you ever need on your doorstep. And that is a clue as to what a sustainable city is like. Sure, that's a big, tall version, and you get smaller versions as well. Uh, but that, that, gives, that gives a sense of it. So the, uh, the planning system in Perth is sort of slowly and, 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 and gradually coming to that realisation. We have seen... Uh, we saw uh, 
We saw Network City, which was then rebadged as Directions 2031, which was then rebadged as Perth and Peel 3.5 million state government policy. Uh, same thing, different front cover. But essentially, it was about uh, creating a more connected city and uh, increasing, increasing densities in, in areas where people can live and work together. The capital city planning framework, which uh, I may be slightly biased, was probably one of the best things that ever came out of the Department of Planning, uh, really sort of started to set a, uh, an agenda about how you, you, you create activity corridors related to public transport, getting people living and working in the, uh, in the similar area and creating good places, whether they're big places or little places. And so the other fundamental part of that is public transport. Uh, because it's not the ideal city, chances are it never will be the ideal city, and that we will need to travel. So if we do need to travel, we need to make sure that it's not by car, that, uh, that we have the opportunity, and it's easy and convenient to go by public transport or, or by foot. Um, Public transport, not just, uh, not just more buses in tunnels, but, uh, but actually creating the right sort of public transport for the right purpose. For the longer range, longer journey trips, trains are great. Buses are great for little short hops, as is uh, Uber and taxis. And, uh, but light rail is the missing link. It's the district level uh, mode of transport that we're currently missing that to, to manage those, uh, those middle distance sort of trips. And then the trick is to put people, whether it's people who are living or people who are working, close to public transport and having a planning system that enables it all to stick together. Um, and a fundamental part of that is growing up rather than growing out. Because if we're going to maximise human exchange whilst minimising the travel necessary to do it, we actually need density. We actually need to bring people closer together. And that means actually going up rather than going out towards North Bunbury and, and South Geraldton, as, as James said. And uh, Perth and Peel at three and a half million makes a sort of a, makes a, a lukewarm attempt at, at doing that, uh, probably better in the central areas, pretty hopeless in the out, outer areas. But uh, it's, it's heading in the right direction. At least planning policy is acknowledging it's, it, it's going in the right direction. We are, I guess, as, a, as an industry, um, struggling against uh, the, the notions of public perception. And I, to be honest, I'm, I'm looking at the distance between me and the door here. I used to be a DAP member. I was a DAP member for four years. Um, and I read a lot of, I read a lot of submissions. And uh, a, lot, a lot of submissions were, and this is actually a quote from one of them, people who live in apartments are undesirables who will break into my home and steal my TV. When, when you have a community that predominantly thinks that, it's really hard to get people accustomed to the idea of actually coming up a bit and, uh, and creating apartments. Uh, people and spend then we call it Brownlee Towers. Yes, and, uh, and, and my, my view is that there's obviously a lot of people, pretty even old, old, older people, who spend a lot of time watching the bill and uh, the Jasmine Allen estate and assume that that's what apartments are. I have a friend of mine uh, who has, a, has an apartment in South Perth on the foreshore. I think it's worth probably around about $8 million. Uh, and there's no way he's going to come around and steal your TV. Because <laughs> he's got a very nice one of his own. <laughs> um, another quote from a submission. Apartment living is bad for families with children. Well, I'm sorry, but... Uh, Look, when you travel around the world, you see children that have grown up in apartments in Europe and in America and all over the world, and they don't turn into psychotic axe murderers. They turn into relatively normal people, just like the rest of us. And, uh, and in fact, the level of amenity in some of the, the more intense areas is better than the level of amenity in, in the suburbs. You can go out into the suburbs and you can see grassless wastelands that uh, you just don't want to play on. And yet you go into urban areas, Portland, by, by way of example, um, Cairns and uh, Portland again, uh, where because there are more people, there's more investment in the things that, that kids can enjoy. Uh, and so you can, as a kid, you can actually have a great life in the city. Admittedly, uh, what we've done in the last 50 years probably hasn't set a, a good precedence when it comes to density. Um, yes, buildings like this have a role to play in providing aff affordable housing, but they don't uh, sell the notion of apartments. When we create medium density that basically turns its back on the world, um, it's, it's hostile, uh, it's dreadful, 
and, uh, and then the, uh, the obligatory uh, glu uh, gruplex developments where you have a house behind 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 a house, behind a house. Um, at the risk of uh, being shot by anyone who lives in one. Uh, we, the urban designers have a term for these. They're called uh, cemeteries for the living. Um, because... <laughs> Because the residents are buried in the back garden somewhere. <laughs> so we, we must try harder as professions, as planners, as architects, as urban designers, we must try harder to, uh, to, 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 to deliver good density and show that density can be good. Now, James talked about change, and as planners, one of our, our sort of main role is, is adapting to change or enabling change to occur. And he made reference to a number of big, big picture challenges that we face. I'll go through them really quickly because he's mentioned them already. Rising energy costs. Here's an interesting little statistic. If an average household got rid of one car, it could amass an extra three quarters of a million dollars in superannuation over a working life. That's the opportunity cost of car ownership. It's not about tires or petrol or depreciation. That is the big number. Changing employment patterns. The days when dad went to work and mum and the 2.4 kids stayed at home, that's long gone. Uh, most households now have two jobs, three jobs, four jobs, five jobs, but often part-time job, part jobs to sustain them. And so people need to live close to where they work. Otherwise, it just costs too much to go and do your four hours a day. And dad would probably, was probably working in an industry. He was probably making stuff. These days, it's all about, it's all about services. He's probably... Uh, uh, writing software for something. And those sort of places, those sort of businesses need different types of locations. You know, the, the, the notion that all businesses need to be in an office tower or in some suburban car park out the front, that's rubbish. Uh, most of the service businesses, the small businesses, the small medium enterprises are looking for funky places. They're looking for places where you can go down the road and get a good cup of coffee and a pizza at lunchtime. That's what, what's, uh, what the staff are looking for. And in the great race for the quality staff, that's what wins out. We have rising house costs. There's 101 reasons for that. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but it's something uh, that we need to think about. You know, there's a notion that everyone has to have a house of 300 square metres. Uh, we don't actually need that. You know, we, can all, we, we can generally get by, like the rest of the world, on uh, sort of 75 or 100 square metre living uh, space. Aging, a really top, looking, looking for grey hairs around the room, uh, a really big uh, issue. Uh, we do a lot of our work in the age sector at the moment. And uh, I guess notwithstanding the issue of what do you do when your parents lose their licence and they're stranded out in the suburbs and how do they get by, you know, do we really see retirement as, a, uh, as retirement villages, uh, just a place to basically wait until, uh, until you get the, the final call from the Grim Reaper? Or, and the other issue is one of uh, economics. Um, you know, the government's expenditure is going up, particularly in relation to health care. Income is going down because people are retiring, so we have this fiscal double whammy. Public health. And when we create places like this that have no amenity, why would you want to walk? Why would you want to get out and walk? Why wouldn't you just stay on the sofa uh, with a beer and a pizza and watch TV and get fatter and fatter and fatter? Uh, which in reality is what's happening when you look at the population health stats. You know, if we create places that are actually worth walk walking to, parks that are actually attractive, streets with footpaths, sh uh, street trees, uh, where you've got shade, you've got shelter, then people might get out of their cars, get out of their houses, and actually start walking. I was in, uh, coming back to Manhattan, I was in New York uh, the year before last, uh, and I travelled around America. In most, in most cities in America, people are really quite portly. Uh, you go to you go to you go to, go to Manhattan and everyone's really thin, <laughs> and uh, you kind of go put two and two together and say there must be a connection. It's not just the quinoa salads. <laughs> the big picture challenge is environmental responsibility. Uh, you know, global warming, climate change, uh, managing water quality, really big issues, and this one, urban inelasticity. So as the city has grown from the little hamlet on the Swan to a sort of a modest town to, to a large city, it has grown exponentially. And what happens is that each year goes by, we need more wires, we need more pipes, uh, we need more schools, police stations, buses, there's more coastal property to pay. Everything gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of that comes at a cost. And who pays? We do, to start with. But really, 
of the people who have to fund it more than anyone else is our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids. And you know, that's a legacy that we are leaving behind. So, that's the end of the, the sermon. Uh, now to the responses. As an urban designer, we have, as urban designers, we have, we have ten commandments. Um, they are uh, sustainability, which is ensuring that places can be supported in terms of community, economic, cultural, and environmental outcomes, i.e. doing the right thing. Permeability, making places accessible by providing people with choices on how to get where they want to need, go, need to go. Variety, increasing the choice of activities, living, working, shopping, etc. Legibility, creating places that are understandable. Robustness, ensuring that places can change their use over time. Appropriateness, creating buildings that look as if they do what they are expected to do and don't look as if they are a spaceship that's just landed, landed from the planet ugly. Uh, richness, providing sufficient detail to make places more interesting. Personalization, allowing people to feel as if they belong to their envir environment. Consultation, allowing the people who use and have responsibility for a place to have a say in how that place is designed. And integration, putting it all together. That's quite a long list to remember. Um, so I have a short version, which is the three Ds. So if, if you're going to remember anything uh, apart from the maximizing human exchange, minimizing the travel necessary to do it, remember this one. The three Ds. Diversity. We're all different, always will be. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. We're all for different things. Yes, we need houses, big houses. We need small houses. We need apartments. We need shops. We need everything. Uh, it's not just about one solution. Density. Maximizing exchange whilst minimizing travel means we need to be closer together. So that's a given. And the last one, because planners have been really good at getting this one for quite a few years. Planners are getting their head around this one, uh, but they're still struggling with this one. And this one is really important. Desirability. Given the ability to choose, we prefer to be where we want to be rather than where we have to be. Now, there's a little story that comes attached with this one. I did some consultation with some Year 12 students uh, in a suburb that will remain nameless in the South East Corridor. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, and, and one of the questions that I asked them was, uh, look, when you leave school and you know, go out there in the big wide world, what it is it about XXXX, this place, uh, that would really, you'd really want to see, that would make you want to, 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 to stay here, raise a family and all of that? And every single one of them said, stuff it. The moment I leave school, I'm out of here. And I'm not coming back. This place is a dump. And when your future community is abandoning you, then you've got a problem. And that's a really, really scary thing. And it's a really hard thing to fix. So, desirability. Personally, I blame architects, and I know there's one in the room at least. <laughs> I won't point him out in case he gets embarrassed. Um, look, I, I, I was quite amused about the whole thing about uh, Elizabeth Key and the, the, the public approbation about it when it was first mooted because it really looked as if someone had been on drugs when they were, they were designing it. And they're going, what the? You know, that, that's not Perth. That's not Perth. You know, that, that's somewhere else. Dubai and the Swan, whatever the phrases were. But it put people off straight away. Likewise, out in Guild Guildford, you know, when they, when they talked about at the back of the Guildford Hotel stacking up a whole pile of shipping, shipping containers and pretending they're apartments, um, you know, it's no wonder that the, uh, the community was offside. And so when we talk about desirability, it's not just desirability generally, it's about the desirability of the built form. And the planning system does nothing about it. As a DAP member, I constantly got my knuckles wrapped for, uh, for talking about design. I was actually told, design is not a planning consideration. That's a quote, which is one of the reasons I, I left the old DAP thing. I, I've had enough. And the other part of it is just the whole planning system. It's about planning by numbers. Uh, and anyone, I know there's a few planners in the room, all of this will look very familiar. We, we construct our, this, this, this urban environment that we're creating by a set of abstract numbers that were in, plucked out of the, the air by planners 10, 20, 30 years ago without any real understanding of what sort of buildings they create. And so we need to get back to a way of describing buildings and future buildings in the way that the community understands. And so, for example, what's been happening in America, for example, over the last 10 years is form-based planning controls where you describe buildings and, and places as to how they generally look and how they generally feel. And so instead of saying, oh, we're going to do R40 or R80 or RAC3, we say, well, 
we're going to do something that looks a bit like this, or something that looks like this, or something that looks like this. And can you get that? They know exactly what they're, what, what they're talking about. And then you can start to write planning controls that actually talk about the shape and form of buildings and, uh, and, and how they stick together, how you get, get, get to keep trees, create courtyards, and provide a level of amenity. And again, drilling down into design guidance. Um, look, I, one, I, I trained as an architect. I know how they work. Um, as, as an architect, you're taught uh, from day one, you are two things. A, you are God. That's, that, 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 that what you do is absolutely brilliant, and everyone will fall at your feet and praise you, uh, and they instill this into you as a student so you absolutely believe it until you become an urban designer and you throw it all away. Uh, and the other thing uh, that, 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 that you're told is that... Uh, well, it's, it's escaped me now, but it'll, it'll, it'll come back. But the, 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 this belief that you are infallible and what you do is right, and that you have the, the right to do whatever you want creatively, that uh, it doesn't matter what the community think, that what you do is right. And we have a lot of... Uh, architects, designers, non-architects, designers out there who are basically running around doing whatever they feel like because there's no planning controls to say otherwise. And so again, what is happening in other places is that we're actually starting to put the brakes on and say, look, there are a set of rules on how you create places. If you want to create a building that looks as if it belongs here, here are a bunch of things that you have to do. A lot of that is currently missing in the WA system. We need to distinguish between urban and suburban. One of the mistakes we make in Perth is that we confuse the two. When it comes to density, we try and create something that's, oh, it's a little bit urban, it's a little bit suburban, it's neither one nor the other, and it ends up looking a mess. When we create, when we're doing planning and we're creating places, we should decide, is it gonna be urban? If it's gonna be urban, let's make it urban. If we want it to be suburban, let's make it suburban, but don't try and confuse the, the, the two, because it really doesn't work. The other thing that's really important is that as we densify, we need to support the transference of landscape. So in the suburban environment, most of the landscape is in the backyard. That's where the trees, the bushes, and, and, and everything is. That's the leafy canopy behind the streets. As it gets denser, that vegetation has to move into the public domain. It has to go into the parks, into the streets. And that's why street trees are probably the most important thing that, that, that councils could be doing and encouraging them and planting them. Because uh, when, you've got the, uh, when you've got the street trees there, the architecture takes a bit of a backside, back, back, back seat. This street, uh, which is in West Vancouver, uh, looks, looks a really nice street. Does anyone want to disagree? Does anyone want to say it doesn't look nice, like a good street? No? Good. Um, the buildings along that street range from three stories in height to 28 stories in height. But you'd never know it because the streets contributes to that sense of place. We need to encourage joined up thinking. What happens generally in local governments and state government departments too uh, is that uh, we have these silos in planning, that we have strategic planners and statutory planners. And the strategic planners are the visionaries. They, they, just, they, they come up with the, the policy and the, the general direction. And the statutory planners go through all that big slide with all the numbers on that I showed you and work out whether something complies or not. We actually need them to get to talk to each other and work together. We need to plan and design for efficient transportation. Uh, you know, we need to accept that the, the future of transportation in a city the size of Perth is not necessarily the bus, it's other types of vehicle, such as, uh, such as, such as light rail. But more importantly, particularly in the outer suburbs, we need to be designing places that work for public transport. Um, this is a little exercise that we've been doing um, sort of down near Mandurah, Pinjara, uh, in response to Perth and Peel at three, three and a half million. Perth and Peel at three and a half million proposes something like a quarter of a million people who live nowhere near any public transport whatsoever. And that's the future. That's state government's vision of the future. Our approach was to say, let's, uh, let's identify where the public transport goes and we will put the houses and the offices and everything else within 800 metres. No more. Everyone, everywhere has to be within walking distance of public transport. It's a pretty fundamental starting point, but we need to do that. We also need to benchmark against other places. 
Uh, one of the things that I often find is that uh, Perth people don't tend to leave Perth very much, and when they do, they go to Bali. And Bali is probably not the, uh, the starting point for, for creating a, a truly wonderful urban environment. Um, I'll put this, this is my favorite slide at the moment. These two aerial photographs are exactly the same area, uh, x square meters, whatever they are. And interestingly, they're both the same density. That there are 53 dwellings in this little shot of Baldivis. And there are 53 dwellings in this place called Ion in South Carolina. Uh, but they are chalk and cheese. That this is WA's version of, of suburbia, which is all garage door and no trees. And this is uh, South Carolina's version of, uh, of suburbia, which has an elegance and a richness and a, lush, a lushness to it. And you can see in the aerial photographs the number of trees. Um, Baldivis, 17 trees. Ion. 126. So, if there's another thing I want you to take from tonight, trees are really important. Um, build rather than subdivide. Most of the, the WA planning industry has been um, developed on subdivision. That's what we've done for 50 years. We've just carved land up, flogged it, and then moved on to the next one. Um, those times have changed. Uh, we now need to think about how we can actually incorporate building and subdividing together. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, no one in the history of mankind has ever created a great place through subdivision. It all comes down at the end of the day to architecture and landscape. Those are the two fundamental elements. Good quality buildings, trees, plants, that's what makes uh, places that are appealing rather than the, uh, the, 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 the uneventful spaces so that, that are created. On the left. Um, on the left, those two are, that's Burswood, Burswood, that's down near Mandura, that's in Sydney. Uh, so we can do it, uh, but yeah, those are all Perth. <laughs> <laughs> and look, something else, this, this might sound a bit uh, contrary to the theme of tonight, but I'd also encourage smaller scale developments, particularly in the apartment market. What, what we have seen as a tendency around Australian cities to go for the really big projects, not just in height, but in width. And what happens is you end up with a building that's got, it's got lots of car park entries, and it's got transformers, and it's got fire hydrant cabinets, and it's got all sorts of junk, and you've got no sense of place, no sense of street uh, to it, and you put 200 dwellings in the hands of one developer. You know, if you're actually going to do 200 dwellings, and you've actually got 10 different sites that have got 20 dwellings each, you actually get diversity, you get a human scale, and you get a much better streetscape. So, again, we shouldn't be focusing on the big ones. At the moment, it's all about the big stuff, and it's about the little stuff. This medium stuff here is really important. In that sort of three to, three to six, three to seven, uh, three to eight story range. We need to overcome our fear of heights. Uh, there's actually a word for it. It's called batophobia. Uh, that, uh, and and what, happen, what happens generally in Perth is we put height restrictions on. You know, so squash it down, squash it down. And what happens when you squash it down is that it just squeezes out to the edge. And so what you have, you end up these really horrible conditions all the way around the, the edge of the site where people are squeezed up against the, the boundary fence, overlooking issues, there's no trees, there's no vegetation. And uh, if we weren't so hung up on height, we could actually get the same number of dwellings, we could actually extrude them up and keep a bit of space between people and get the trees and get some, some amenity in there. So I know people think, you know, if we, we stop the height, we stop the density, we stop the people. You don't actually stop the density. You actually end up with the same density. You just end up with bad density rather than good density. And we need to explain the why rather than just the what. Again, with my DAP hat on, Architects would come in, we'd give a present, oh, here is my scheme, da -da 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 -da. this is what it looks like, I know that, I've seen the drawings. Uh, what architects generally don't do is explain why the design ends up the way it did. What is the reason behind it? What's the logic? And likewise with the community, when we're planning a place, don't just in secret draw up a, a, a plan, a structure plan, uh, and, and just put it out for advertising and hope that people will somehow say something nice about it. Work with them from day one, get them involved in the journey. And, uh, and, and take the community with them and have, have their input. The, the community are not the enemy. Uh, they, are the, they are the client at, at the end of the day. And in that respect, it's also about the buildings. 
Um, this little like the thing came out of an exercise we did on Beaufort Street a couple of years ago. And we put this slide up and we said this is about the sort of scale of building that we're looking at in this location. And a number of the people in the room said, so you do that, it'll be over our dead body. We'll be chaining ourselves to the fence and, uh, and, and standing in front of the bulldozers. And so uh, we knocked up a quick model and said, said, well, what if we did this? And they all went, oh, yeah, that's fine. No problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> And it's the, it's the same building, it's the same height, it's got, it's the same, it's got the same number of units in it, but it's all about the architecture. And, uh, and this, this other one, this was a little site in Subiaco, where the, the council said, Under, you will demolish those over our dead bodies. Uh, you are not, it's, it's contributing to character, it's not a heritage listed building, contributing to character, you cannot remove it. And we said, well, what if we did this? Instead of doing a sort of a curtain wall glass office building, we did something like this. And... Uh, and Subiaco Council, if anyone's you familiar with Subiaco Council, they're uh, somewhat negative when it comes to development. Uh, they all turned around and said, fantastic, when can you start? And so that reinforced something else that came out of my DAP, uh, my DAP meetings, and that I realised that one of the reasons that the community uh, fight against tall buildings is because they, they're pretty sure that whatever's going to be built is going to be an ugly building. And that a tall, ugly building is much worse than a small, ugly building. So let's go for the small one. But if we started to produce great tall buildings, things might change. And related to that, uh, the other thing that I've been doing in the last couple of years, apart from the one I've been, uh, been working, is actually doing a series of artworks. And so I actually trained as a, uh, as a sort of heritage architect back in London in the, in the, in the days. And one of the things that's always fascinated me is that people say beauty's in the eye of the beholder. That's bullshit. Um, but, uh, there are rules to beauty. There are things you can definitely identify that make something more beautiful than something else. And architects have known this, for, and building designers have known this for about 2,000 years and decided to throw out the rule books uh, sort of 50 years or 50, 80 years ago. And uh, look, I think most people in the community, when they walk past a beautiful building, will go, yeah, that's nice. That looks good. I, I get that. Uh, but they won't necessarily know why. Well, there are a set of rules. So what I was then starting to do was explore different architectures from around the world and try and pull them apart, analyse them, understand what, uh, what made them beautiful, and then put them back together again and, uh, and see if it worked. So getting to the conclusion... So you're not going to give us the rules? <laughs> That's another talk for another day. <laughs> and I do have a talk on that one. Uh, the elements of a sustainable city. People, and lots of them. Human interaction, human exchange, minimising the travel necessary to do it. Good streets, trees, um, architecture that's relatively pleasant to look at, and cars. Look, I'm not anti-cars, um, but cars need to behave themselves. And they don't need great big car parks and swathes of bitumen. If they behave themselves, drive slowly and park where they're supposed to, they can actually contribute to the streetscape. Again, landscaping, getting landscaping there into the public domain, um, helping to manage stormwater quality, yes, but also just visual relief and shade and shelter. Um, apartment buildings, residential, density in, in different flavours, big, small and medium. Heritage. Uh, heritage is incredibly important. And the sustainable city of the future is not just about technology and new stuff. It's all about the old stuff. There's a saying that goes along the lines of something you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been or where you've come from. And that coming from something is really important. Um, in my experience, kids that are brought up in an environment that has a history have a deep, deeper respect for society and how it works and, and, and the world in general. They have reference points. They have a reference, something that they can identify. When they're older, they can look back and they can go, yeah, when I was a kid, and da-da-da-da-da. We're, we're breeding a, a generation of kids in the outer suburbs that have no reference points at all. Uh, their only reference point is Pokemon Go at the moment, you know, it's, uh, and, and, and the Kardashians. It's, uh, you know, that, that sense of place and what anchors someone to a place is really important. And in that respect, there's probably some stuff that we can, we can learn from the Noongar community and, and other indigenous communities about that sense of understanding of the, uh, the relationship with the land. Great streets, great trees, footpaths, 
Uh, light rail, again, the, the missing ingredient in, uh, in Perth, and that's Portland again. And, uh, and yes, there is, there is a place for this in the sustainable city, for, for, for hyperdensity, for superdensity. Uh, we need to find the places for it. South Perth, kind of an obvious location uh, for it, uh, you know, Perth, Perth CBD, but it is part of that story. So that's pretty well me done now. Um, i leave you with two other thoughts. Um, if anyone's interested in any of the stuff that I've gone on about, uh, we've just put together a kind of little website-y thing. Uh, we were, someone said to me at a dinner party, they said, uh, said, oh, there must be 101 things you could do to make Perth a better place. And I went, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so we came up with 101 things to make Perth a better place. So go to perth101.wordpress.com and uh, they're all grouped together under a bunch of themes. So if, you got, if you're bored and there's nothing much on TV, uh, you can have a read through that. And finally, the question. Everyone generally agrees that a sustainable city is a good idea and that there are lots of things that other people can do. But what are you prepared to do? Move to New York City? Sell the car, ride to work, move to an apartment near the station, dig up the lawn and plant ground cover, use the recycling bill bin more often, or absolutely nothing because you're special. <laughs> Tell us what you think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. That was fantastic, absolutely brilliant. So Linda, I believe we have a post with that question. If you're able, can you get onto our Facebook page and post uh, an answer to that? That would be terrific. Oh, oh. How many? How many? Uh, five or six. So we've got a few answers to James' question. So don't forget to answer that. And again, if you if you don't want to do it that way, you can write answers down, leave them with us, and we will collate them and put them up for you. Um, while you're doing that, Malcolm, if you're up for it, and there's some questions, would you be prepared to answer them? Yeah, sure. Okay. Do we have any questions for Malcolm? Yes. All right. I'm an American. I've lived in Portland. I've lived in San Francisco. Uh, so I understand the multi-use system of, of housing. Here in Bayswater, are they looking to go with the multi-use so you have parking underneath, you have shop fronts, and then you have apartment buildings above? Is that the direction that we're going? To be honest, I don't think you have a choice. I think you have to. Yeah. Um, that uh, the, the current the, the current way that, that, that Bayswater is, it's, it's got a lot of housing stock. It's aging. It's getting old. It's going to it's going to need renewing. And you need people. You need density. And you need people living and working in close proximity. And mixed use, uh, multiple use, is the perfect way of doing it. Mm -hmm. The Romans were doing it. Uh, went, went around Pompeii, about well, two thousand years ago. They were living in multi-storey mixed use. Okay, so it was only two or three stories. It wasn't big, but it was mixed use. And there was the baker down below, and they lived up above. Uh, it's, it's the obvious way to do it. And uh, in the town centres and along the major roads, it's, it's a no-brainer. But how, but, but how do you get the politicians to move in that direction to explain to them that this is the, the viable way of, one, extending your tax base to bringing more people into an area where Chinese mm -hmm. well, welcome, <laughs> well, well, welcome to my world. <laughs> um, a lot of hard work. Um, but uh, I, I think we have to, things are working in our favour. We, we had, a, we had a, a rule of thumb back in the days when I worked in the Department of Planning. Um, we had a rule of thumb that you can't, you can't fix a place until you get permission from the community to fix it. And sometimes that's about working with the community early on, before things go bad, and actually build up a head of steam so that the, the, the councillors, the local members, actually hear the community and, and realise that you have to do this. The other approach is you should leave it alone. You walk away and you let it deteriorate until it gets to a point where it's so bad that they come crawling on their knees and go, please, please, fix, 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 fix this place. But you don't want to do that. Yeah. No, because I, I live here in Bayswater, and, and where I'm at, I've seen probably within the last two years, 40 different buildings and being built within within the last couple of years of being here. And I'm just like, wow, this is all right. But then all of a sudden, you know, you come towards the, the train station and what's supposed to be the city center of Bayswater, and you're like, wow, 
Looks like they forgot. <laughs> I think, I think it, 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 is, it, is coming, it, it is coming. I made the observation to, uh, to one of the planners at, at Bayswater um, that the wave is working its way out. Um, I, I live, I, I live in, uh, in Vincent, so just, just over the border. Uh, Vincent, for the last sort of three, three or four years, has been going at gangbusters. There's buildings popping up all over the place. And that wave is sort of gradually moving out uh, along the railway line, along Guildford Road, and, and, it, and it's coming. And that's why it's really important that uh, the city of Oswald actually gets its planning house in order and gets all its policies lined up, uh, well written and, and in place, so that when that wave does hit, the big wave hits, that you've actually got the policy framework to, uh, to make sure that you get good outcomes not some of the, the crap outcomes that have been the, the technical term, uh, some of the, 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 the suboptimal outcomes that uh, we've seen elsewhere in the metro area. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob Brown, uh, Town of You left a question unanswered. You had the graphic, the rather gross graphic of the uh, Victoria Key. And uh, I was wondering what your opinion is now, from that graphic that put everybody off, to the reality and what is likely to happen there now. What is your opinion, is your opinion on that? Ah, uh, yes, the Elizabeth Key question. <laughs> um, um, the diplomatic answer is I'm reserving judgment until it's finished. Uh, but uh, the signs so far are not, not promising. Um, they, in principle, I think getting the city and the river to talk to each other is really important. And in that respect, bringing the water closer to the city is a great, is a great thing. And I'm absolutely 100% behind that. What I worry about is the, the quality of the public realm around the, around the inlet. Uh, I went, I, I was in Melbourne when it opened, but I came back and when I cycled down there on a Sunday morning, it was about 42 degrees, and it was incredibly hostile. There was no shade, no one was sitting anywhere because no one could find a shady place to sit. It was, it's, uh, it's the same when you go down there in winter and the wind's blowing, it's, it's really hostile. Now that will change to some extent when the buildings are built. My worry about the buildings is that they are large footprint buildings. So the sort of buildings you see in Docklands in Melbourne, where you, there's a couple of token shops at the bottom in a lobby, and the rest of the frontage is taken up with, uh, with, with services and bin, bin service areas and car parks and car park entrances and fire hydrant cabinets and all that sort of stuff. That does not make good town. So I'm not hopeful uh, about it. I'd like to think that it's going to be good, but uh, yeah. we'll see. In Melbourne, you spoke about urban and suburban development, etc. And that there's an area that seems to be really overlooked a lot of the time. You've got commercial areas that, to me, seem to be really underutilised a lot of the time. You've got there's probably a, a sort of a, a shire issue as well. You know, you may talk about sort of view on the blue chains, but you've got all these massive tracts of land that have huge amounts of area. There's plenty of car parking there. There's buildings that are just used during the day. They've got all the plumbing. They've got all the infrastructure, and yet shires will not allow owners to live in their premises. And they could even possibly, you know, have people who work in those premises sharing that and they wouldn't have to travel. So it would be, it'd be sort of like so many savings there. But no shire that I'm aware of anywhere in, well, Basel definitely not. They won't definitely, I'll work over that way. And all through Perth and probably Australia. It's, why is this area completely overlooked and not utilised? I've got another question too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, 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 I will have forgotten the first one by the time you get to the end of the second one. Um, one of the observations I've been planning in the last sort of 50 years is all about deconstructing the city. It's about, it's about pulling it apart. And uh, so if you look at all of the, the planning policy that was done up until quite recently, it was about, well, we're going we're gonna to have people shopping over there and we're going to have all the rich people living over there, and we're going to have the poor people living there, and they're going to go play over there, and when they all get go drive in their cars and go to work, they're going to play over there. And, when, and on a Friday evening, uh, when they want something to eat, they'll all go to Northbridge. Uh, so it was all about these sort of monocultures of different, of, of different uses. And so that's one of the reasons that you end up with these large commercial areas, because they were designed for one use and one use only, which is uh, 
a box with a large car park out and, uh, and a little bit of light industrial stuff going on. And, uh, and that's why it doesn't work. Um, if you, uh, but if you're you get not even allowed to make it work as an individual, you don't even get the choice to do it. No. Because you're not allowed yeah. to and that's because it's, it's that's because it's based on old-fashioned, old-fashioned twentieth-century thinking. So, so, how do you go about so what you actually then have to start doing is looking at those areas and say, how do we actually turn them into mixed-use areas? Mm -hmm. So, for example, across the river in Belmont, uh, their sort of uh, sort of industrially sort of area. <laughs> The yeah, commercial area, they, they've actually put they've actually turned the whole thing into mixed use, and, and they've actually said you can do this this other stuff, and bit by bit you, you start to get the other uses coming in there. So, you know, sooner or later, you know, start with some cafes, some restaurants, and you know, people tentatively start to do other things, and then you get a bit of residential, and then everyone twigs that this is the, the new trendy uh, new trendy place to go, and it all it all piles in. Um, and if you go to any sort of major city around the world you'll find that the guy who fixes your TV or the guy that sells bicycles actually does it from a shop below, uh, below the 20 really? apartments up above. Um, so it, it can be done. But we need to change that culture of monoculture and actually think about any commercial area as, you know, apart from perhaps the Kunana industrial strip, uh, as a sort of more of a mixed-use environment. Because I can tell you the chance to build a building to see that because shires weren't allowed to happen. Yeah, bike, bikes are an interesting one. Uh, what, what most people don't realise about Perth is, uh, when you talk about bikes, people go, oh, no one cycles in Perth, the weather's too hot, the weather's dreadful. And you kind of think, well, for nine months of the year, it's actually perfect. <laughs> and there's a couple of days where it's wet, and there's a couple of days when it's hot, but it's really good. And you know, people refer to um, uh, Seattle, and which has a really high level of bike, uh, bike uh, ridership. The weather in, Se in, in Seattle and Vancouver is dreadful. Uh, it rains every day, just about every day. Uh, so we've got that we've got that going for us. We at Perth actually has the highest rate of bike ownership of any capital city in Australia. Uh, we uh, there was a survey I saw recently that actually said that uh, Perth had the, the the most amount of bike lanes of any city capital city in Australia, which yeah, surprised me too. Uh, and because we think there isn't enough, but I think that's that part of the key to it is actually making sure the infrastructure is there, uh, that that it, you actually feel safe and, and comfortable riding riding your bike, and then we can actually unlock those sort of half a million bikes that are spread around the metro area and get so people out on is them. This, is this a job for Lisa? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go and lobby. Okay. So it's a good idea. What about the Uber world of bicycle and bicycle hire and? Again, that hasn't come to Perth yet. If you go to, uh, I'm not, sort of recently I've sort of been in sort of at, in Melbourne and, and Brisbane, and then on just about in every street corner, there's a rack of bikes where you can you can help yourself to bike and go cycle and drop it off. Again, I, I was I was in I was in Washington again two years ago, and, uh, and you kind of think Washington, you know, the, the, the capital, Washington D.C., capital of America, everyone would be driving around in, in big black Hummers or something, and uh, most people were riding. And just you know, people riding bikes everywhere. Uh, so uh, yeah, we can do it. We just need the infrastructure and the uh, and start getting that culture shift. And I'm, 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 my my view is a little bit out there, uh, but I'm also of the view that uh, if we weren't so anal about uh, cycle helmets, then perhaps more people would get on their bikes as well. Thanks. I, I actually think part of our problem is that we still have a colonial mentality and, uh, and, and, and the nature of the beast is that we, we just keep expanding and subdividing and, and, and then building out to the zero lot line. 
Uh, I think what we need to be doing is reversing that trend and starting to amalgamate titles and going up and have perme permeable space, and, and, and you say that as well. Uh, also on the design, I think it's really good that we uh, insist on balconies, on, on, on things, so that people can live outside if they're going up as well. Uh, but the big issue I have is that wherever we're going up, it's one bedroom, one bathroom, two bedroom, two bathroom. And there's, there's no diversity in that. Um, and, and I worry about the, the type of, you know, of, of multi-res housing that we're building because I don't think it's, it, it has flexibility over here. And I also think that our R codes between R20 and R60 have failed. Yeah, the medium, the medium density ones are the problem. Yeah. They, they're, they're, a, they're, a, they're a serious problem. Um, one of the things, apart from my day job, or suppose it is part of my day job, I also sit on the design review committees or design advisory committees for uh, Perth, Vic Park, Melville, um, part of South Perth, and well, I'm sort of Vincent, Vincent one. And uh, so we, we see a lot of projects, uh, partner projects come through every year. We probably look at probably 100 plus projects a year. One of the things that we've noticed in the last six months, maybe the last six to nine months, is that there's been a move away from the one bedroom apartments. Uh, three years ago, everyone was filling buildings full of one bedroom apartments. They were small, mean, cheap, nasty, horrible things aimed at the investor market. Not cheap. Well, yeah, not that cheap. Uh, what we're seeing now uh, in a lot of the apartments, that are, the buildings that are coming across our desk, is that they are predominantly two and three bedrooms, but the one bedrooms have disappeared. But I think the important thing there is we're now starting to see three bedroom apartments mm -hmm. coming in because Developers have finally realised, which we've actually been telling them for a few years, that the, that the prime market is not the, uh, the investor market for the, cheap, for, for, the, for the lower end of stuff. It's actually for the downsizers and it's for, for baby boomers who are looking to, uh, to perhaps sell a house that, that might be worth sort of eight, nine hundred thousand, uh, buy an apartment for, for, for six or seven, decent sized apartment, a quality of life that they're, they're used to, where they can put their stuff in. And, uh, and, and, and tip a couple of hundred grand into their, into their super fund. That, that seems to be the, uh, the prime market at the moment. So, fingers crossed, we're going to get better diversity. But the problem we've had in Bassendean is that the, the, the developers have come in, you know, five stories, they say one, two, and three, and then they come back and they say, their marketing people say, the threes won't sell, so we're just going to make it all ones and twos. And, and that's, the, that's the issue, I think. We, 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 the project that we've been involved with, uh, which has just now been completed, um, and the three bedrooms sold first. Yeah. That, that, because it, it was in the western suburbs, and you know, there's, a, there's a, a good market there, people can pay the money. But that's what they were looking for. They were looking for something to replace their, uh, their large house on their uh, thousand square meter lot. Can I just respond to that? Because John Bell Johnson at the launch last, at our last event, at the launch event, did talk about that and said that will, that will come to pass. It's just still a very immature market, but the free beds will come through. And, and what you experience is exactly what the market is saying, but it is changing. Um, I've got a question for Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm, you talked about the Design Advisory Committee. Um, Basewater doesn't have one. Could you just um, talk a little bit about what is a DAC, why it's not a DAP? And what do you actually do in a DAC? Okay, DAC is not a, a decision-making body, it's an advisory body. And so, the, uh, I guess the, the logic behind it is that back in the old days, that the councillors made decisions and councillors knew a little bit about houses because they lived in houses. Uh, but their understanding of the complexities of larger buildings and apartment buildings and mixed use buildings it was a bit beyond them, so the idea was to get uh, DACs uh, where you had uh, sort of architects, planners, landscape architects, services engineers, uh, who had a body of expertise to actually provide the council, uh, and more, more recently the DAP, with um, a good understanding of whether this was a good project or not. Uh, but more importantly, to provide advice on how to make it better. And so, so one of the things that we do in our, our DAC is when an architect comes in and it's a bit, it's a bit ordinary, we actually figure out how to make it better and we continue working on it until we get it to a point that uh, we think it's good enough to be, to be approved. So I think that's the fundamental difference, whereas a DAP is actually a decision-making body. And my, in my experience, and at the risk of being quoted in the paper, uh, as, a, as a DAP member, uh, the DAP 
one, there's a lot of stuff about the DAP system that's actually good, uh, but one of its failings uh, is that I think the quality of buildings that went through the DAP actually diminished. And that's because developers saw it as a shortcut. And, uh, and so it occurred to me that the, the DAC actually becomes really, really important. If you care about the quality of buildings that are being put up in your place, then a DAC is the, really the only tool in the council's toolkit to, to make sure that you get, you get that quality. Because once it goes to the DAC, it's, it's, a, it's a decision that's coming out of your control. What about the set, though? I just all appeal to the set and get it past. Uh, yeah, but again, if that's that's if you the, the SATs only if you really get a get a refusal. If Can you, you explain the acronym? Oh, SAT, SAT State Administrative Tri Tribunal. So if something gets refused, whether it's by council or the DAP, then the, the, the developer normally goes to the State Administrative Tribunal, and then there's a sort of a bit of a negotiation process or a bit of a legal process uh, to, to 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 then resolve it. But again, my view is that if you have the DAC process, and that helps to ensure that you get a decent, approvable outcome in the first place, you don't actually have to go to SAT. It actually takes them out of the picture. Malcolm, I might uh, jump in. Um, it's nine o'clock, and for you under 35, actually they've left. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're tougher than them, there's no doubt about that. Um, look, we might wrap it up there, but are you guys happy to hang around for a while? And if you want to come and have a chat with them, or with Lisa, I'm sure that she would love to have a chat. If you want to talk to future Bayswater about what we're doing, a lot of things have been brought up tonight that we're advocating for, sinking the railway line, a good activity centre plan, the DAC, we're really keen that that's uh, something that Bayswater has. We're happy to talk to you about that. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, first of all, can we thank our three speakers tonight once more, Lisa, James, and Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the Bayswater Hotel for letting us have this wonderful room. I'd like to thank Perth's greatest ever photographer and the video guy, Peter Dansevich, who's up against the wall there. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much. And if I could ask the four of you to come and see us after, we've got some lovely wine for you. Pete can give that to me. Um, also, I'd like to thank, uh, have we got a slide of thank yous? Or? No. <laughs> Andrew's just finding it. Um, I'd like to thank uh, a couple of graphic designers that have helped us, and Joe Byrne is one of those, a local lady. And also, Andrew, one of your colleagues, I believe. He doesn't have a name, we'll worry about that later. Um, We'd also like to thank uh, my colleagues in Future Bayswater for putting this on and we have uh, a whole lot of people here which I won't read out to you but uh, putting these nights on is, is a lot of work so I want to thank uh, all of you for coming tonight. Um, if you've enjoyed tonight, we've actually got four more of these planned. Uh, originally we were only going to have four but we're up to five already. The next one is on Thursday 18th of August which is in two weeks time. It's going to be right here in the Heritage Room. And our two speakers for that event are Bill Hames from Hames Sharpley. Bill is an industry statesman, planner, urban designer and architect. And Marion Fulker, who's the Chief Executive Officer for the Committee of, for Perth, which is a private sector fund think tank focused on the future of the Perth metropolitan region. And then we have three more events after that. Now, if you want to come, uh, the best way to make sure that you are, uh, have a spot is to register. And one of the better ways to do that is actually to subscribe to Future Bayswater. And if you actually want to do that tonight on paper, you can do that. You can do that online. We have a website. We have a Facebook page. Please visit and have a look. And again, um, I guess one of the big messages out of tonight is what can you do doing something? And many of you who subscribe actually ticked a connect and contribute box. If you want to, we actually meet fortnightly in here in the Heritage Room, and I think our next meeting is the night before the uh, next event, which is the 17th of August. You're more than welcome to come along. It starts at 7 o'clock. We would love to hear from you and uh, make our circle wider. So look, thank you very much for coming tonight. And if you want to hang around and have a chat, thanks again. Drive safely home. Good night, everyone. Thank you.